There we go. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so this will be a, uh, the first in a series of uh, presentations on moons of the solar system. And, you know, there are over 220 moons around what, you know, what you might call normal moons or traditional moons around planets, over 400 around other small bodies, Kuiper Belt, TNOs. So out of the close to 700 moons in the solar system, what luck that, what an honor that Titan gets to go first. I think that's just incredible. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what it is, Lou. Uh, it's to coincide with that lovely James Red image of Titan uh, released last week or the week before. Uh, so we thought Titan would be a good first place to start. Titan is a great place to start, and we've known this is a great place for many years. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the history of Titan exploration, tell you why it's an interesting moon, tell you why we are spending so much of uh, ESA and NASA tax dollars to, uh, to explore it. So let's get going. I can. You have control. <laughs> I have control. Okay. There we go. So um, back in the 1600s, uh, the first uh, uh, notice, the first observations of Titan that were realized were uh, by Christian Huygens, the Dutch astronomer. And uh, of course, you will recognize that name because that was what we named the, um, the Titan probe that, was, uh, that went out to Saturn with the Cassini spacecraft. We named it after Christian Huygens. So in this um, uh, excerpt from his uh, writings, you see Saturn and you see two stars. You see one in the uh, kind of at the three o'clock uh, position and one at the seven o'clock position. The three o'clock position is actually a star, but the one at the seven o'clock, that was in fact Titan. And he was able to watch that over time, see that it was moving, calculate an orbit. And so he's credited with the discovery of Titan. Then in uh, 1907, uh, with better optics, better telescopes, it was noticed that uh, Saturn has a quality called limb darkening. This is an edge effect that you see, that you would see in a body that has an atmosphere. So as you're penetrating down further into the atmosphere, rather than going from deep, deep space to solid surface, you see a gradation of uh, intensities. And this was the first indication that um, that Titan had an atmosphere. So that alone makes it unique among all other moons of the solar system. Then in the 1940s, um, uh, Gerard Kuiper, who you will recognize the Kuiper Airborne Observatory was named after as well as the Kuiper Belt. He had two big things named after him. Um, I'm still waiting for my first thing, but I know it's, I know it's coming. Um, and he uh, did some spectroscopic observations of Titan and noticed um, uh, that there was methane, or as you say in the UK, methane in the atmosphere. See, I'm getting an error message. Something went wrong, Trey, reloading the page. Uh, can you see the slide? Uh, we can see the methane slide, yes. Okay, very good, very good. And we'll continue. So not only does Titan have a have an atmosphere. Now there's methane in the atmosphere. And why is that interesting? Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, it is a biomarker. It, it can be the result of biological activity or it can be um, a resource for uh, microbial, let's say, um, activity. And also it shouldn't be there. Uh, methane is very uh, volatile and uh, gets broken apart into its uh, component elements of carbon and hydrogen very easily with ultraviolet radiation. So the fact that it is there on Titan is um, something that makes Titan even more interesting. So uh, just a few facts uh, about Titan. By the way, this is an, an image uh, that was taken by the Cassini VIMS uh, uh, system, Visual and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer. This image is not what you would see if you were just kind of flying out there and looked out your window. Uh, in this image, we're looking through the very opaque photochemical haze that, sh that surrounds Titan down into the surface. So we see surface and lower atmospheric features. And you can do this between um, methane absorption bands in the, in the near infrared. And I'll be showing you other pictures and talking about that quality. But just kind of a, a 
kind of a, a Titan 101 here, um, diameter of 5150 kilometers, uh, surface gravity of 1.35 meters per second squared. Um, most of the atmosphere is nitrogen, predominantly nitrogen, just like a planet we all know and love. Um, with other hydrocarbons and nitriles, the surface pressure 50% greater than the Earth. Uh, and because Titan doesn't have a, uh, as much gravity, its, it's uh, atmosphere is much more extended than Earth's atmosphere. And then, of course, um, it has all of these Earth-like features with seasons and rain and clouds and, and lakes and, and rivers. And you say, wow, what a great place. But it does all of this at a temperature of 94 Kelvin. Uh, for you Fahrenheit uh, friends, it's 290 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So all of the um, uh, fluvial and atmospheric uh, evapotransport mechanisms that go on are not with water. They are with um, other very interesting uh, hydrocarbons. Just as a uh, comparison of Titan to all the other moons of Saturn, clearly the largest moon. Not all the other moons of Saturn, but many of the larger ones. And here's a comparison with just other solar system objects. So you see Earth and Venus on the left. Venus is about 95% the diameter of Earth. Mars is about half the diameter of Earth. And Titan is next and bigger than Mercury. So if Titan was not orbiting Saturn, uh, it would clearly be another planet. But it is orbiting Saturn, so we don't count it. Well, with all, with all of this, uh, these interesting findings, uh, it's no surprise that we've sent a number of missions out to um, investigate Titan. We sent the uh, uh, Pioneer 11 to Saturn. This is a flyby mission that uh, flew by in 79. Voyages 1 and 2 flew by in 1980 and 81. Again, flyby missions. And then uh, the Cassini spacecraft uh, uh, on its way um, uh, with gravity assist from Jupiter orbited uh, Saturn and dropped the Huygens probe into the atmosphere of Titan. Cassini made many, many um, close encounters with Titan uh, because it's a, it's a very uh, important object of interest. And we'll be uh, looking at some of the observations from that in just a moment. So um, early on, early robotic exploration, Pioneer 11 uh, went to the Saturnian system and, uh, and took some pictures of Titan. This, it turns out, now I guess, I'm, I'm not sure if my, um, I have something blocking it here, but this is supposed to be the first robotic spacecraft image of Titan. Of course, this is Saturn uh, the, uh, here in the middle here with its rings and the shadow of the rings on the, on the beautiful cloud tops of Saturn. But on the bottom, if, if, if it's still in frame, is a small dot, and that is the dot, that is the figure of Titan, wow. Pioneer 11. We've come a long way, haven't we, Lou? <laughs> oh, we have, as I'll show you in just a second. This was the best image of Titan taken by Pioneer 11 at a distance of 360,000 kilometers. Wow. Pioneer 11 had a two-color camera. And uh, again, what we're seeing here is uh, this is a, in, the, in the visible part of the spectrum. So you're seeing the, the atmospheric haze that, is, that shrouds the entire planet. Uh, and uh, prevents visible wavelength uh, light from penetrating. Haze kind of like um, um, smog in, uh, in, in LA in the summertime, in Los Angeles in the summertime. Um, and this was the best image that Pioneer 11 had, and at the time, the best image that humanity had of Titan. Didn't learn a lot then. <laughs> uh, there, there, were, there was other data taken. Uh, right. uh, spectroscopy of the atmosphere, magnetic field data, and so on, but that was the best visual image. Then in 1977, the two Voyager spacecraft were launched on flyby uh, missions to the outer solar system. And uh, over here on the left, we have, I think this is a Voyager 1 image of Titan, a uh, much better image. You can see a couple of things here, of course, the um, the orange-red uh, photochemical haze. By the way, this is produced by the photodisassociation of nitrogen um, and um, 
and meth and um, uh, sorry nitrogen and um, carbon in the atmosphere, and uh, the methane and the and the nitrogen break into these amazing um, uh, concophony of chemicals, which makes Titan even uh, more interesting. You see that the top part of the uh, image here of Titan looks darker than the bottom part. And this is not a um, solar angle effect. This is a, actually a compositional and particle size effect because uh, the atmosphere moves wholesale from one hemisphere to the other every uh, Titan year. And uh, Titan year is roughly 29 and a half Earth years, just like Saturn, as it is tidally locked to its planet. You can also see on the top here, uh, just a little bit, uh, it looks like it's a little bit not quite round at about your one o'clock position. And that um, that is the um, North Polar Hood, which is a, a region where um, uh, chemicals build up in the atmosphere in the winter season for that pole. On the right here, you see some models that we've been able to make of uh, the atmosphere of Titan, uh, showing the photochemical haze, the particulates and the uh, that are that are produced the haze layer further down and then these hydrocarbons and nitriles kind of precipitate precipitate down through the atmosphere and act as nucleation sites for other chemicals to glomp onto and then they fall out onto the surface so, uh, temperature and pressure of this uh, pressure of the surface is such that methane can um, evaporate back up and form methane clouds or methane clouds and so you have a methane cycle here instead of a water cycle that you'd find on Earth. This is just an example of some of the other kinds of data that we got from the Voyager spacecraft. Obviously, this isn't an image. These squiggly lines come from the IRIS, the Infrared Interferometer Spectrometer on, uh, on Voyager. And this is from uh, the SATAT link on Voyager 1, very, very close flyby of, Sa of Titan. That's quite a complicated um, uh, cacophony of chemicals there, isn't it? It is. It's complicated. It's hard to understand for most people. And so at the daily press conferences, when um, uh, plus or minus two weeks of encounter uh, out at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, the imaging team got all of the press and all the oohs and ahs, and we'd show a few of these and uh, nobody mm. cared. Um, but there's, a, there's an amazing amount of information in here. You can see... Um, many of the hydrocarbons and nitriles, HCN, hydrogen cyanide, C2H2, um, acetylene, um, CH4, uh, uh, methane, and so on, and ethane, C2H6. Lots and lots of these chemicals that are produced by this prebiotic atmosphere that Titan has. And these images, uh, these uh, little squiggly lines turned out to be very important in understanding the um, birth and evolution of Titan. It, how just out of interest, how does that does that compare at all with what uh, New Horizons found at Pluto? Uh, in in some ways, it does. Uh, for example, Pluto has a detached haze layer. We haven't shown that quite yet here. Mm -hmm. um, that um, uh, that Titan also has. Uh, Pluto's chemistry is different. It's colder. If you can imagine being colder than this. Oops. Let's cancel that. Um, <laughs> Um, but it, uh, it also has uh, uh, many of the chemicals that we see here. Um, so, uh, yes, and uh, I think it deserves its planet status just from that alone. <laughs> Indeed. So we move on, and in 1997, 20 years after Voyager, we launched the Cassini spacecraft along with its Huygens Titan probe to Titan. And again, this image here, is um, from the VIMS uh, uh, instrument on Cassini showing the surface features of Titan. And here we start to see some darker regions. These are lakes on Titan. Um, you can see um, some of the surface as well as some highlighted parts of the surface, which are likely in this image, methane clouds in the lower, uh, the lower uh, uh, troposphere of Titan. There's the launch of Cassini. Oops. And here's an, an artist's rendition of what it would have looked like as Cassini approached the Saturnian system. It released the Huygens probe to, um, 
to fly uh, unaided um, into the atmosphere of Titan using aerobraking and then eventually a parachute, which as you might imagine was um, is very efficient with a very thick atmosphere of Titan to uh, land on the surface. And just on that point, Lou, uh, somewhere on YouTube, there is a real time record of um, Huygens' descent through the atmosphere that you can sit and watch, uh, which is uh, which is amazing. Ab absolutely. And, and so landing on the surface is amazing. And we got our first glimpses of the surface, which I'll show you in a minute. But for me, who studied the atmosphere of Titan, the um, progression of Huygens down through the atmosphere, taking measurements of temperature, pressure, composition at each level, uh, was uh, even more, more important and more interesting. So we got a vertical distribution um, uh, of, the, of temperature, pressure, wind speed, composition, and so on at, that, at one place mm. and at one time, but uh, through the um, uh, atmosphere of Titan. But wasn't the, weren't the winds um, a bit different to what had been predicted, I seem to remember? They, they were. And um, the, they were able to track the, um, the probe using Doppler measurements uh, that were received by uh, Cassini and then sent to Earth. Um, and the uh, upper atmosphere was a little, um, a little more turbulent uh, than they had predicted. The lower atmosphere, not as turbulent. Um, and um, so this is, why you, um, this is why you go there, right? Mm. I seem to remember that it, it took longer to descend through the atmosphere than they, they thought it was going to. I think so, yeah. yeah, so yeah. We, we had just our, our models from um, uh, what we, little we knew from Voyager and from uh, ground base and uh, Earth orbiting observations. Yeah. And I'll show you some of those in a few minutes as well. Okay. So this and is it, just... Sorry, I was going to say, and it all worked amazingly. It was a, it was a flawless descent. Not only a flawless descent, but they pinpointed the landing a billion and a half kilometers away. So in my in my way of looking at it, the real heroes of this mission are the people who understood the celestial mechanics um, of uh, how things operate in the solar system and are able to guide this thing miraculously to a pinpoint landing. Hmm. So the Huygens probe descended. It had a uh, camera facing, a downward facing camera, and we started to see now uh, through much of the haze, uh, started to see surface features. Uh, you can see um, what we were, <laughs> we, we used to call these um, fluvial channels or, 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 or flow channels. And um, uh, I, think, I think we were a little coy about calling them rivers at the time, but you can see valleys and mountain ranges and fluvial channels. And then in the lower right, you see a, a little more uh, uh, magnified image of the surface in black and white here. Clearly, you see the um, rivers. You can see the darker area on the bottom that's a uh, hydrocarbon lake. And these little puffy things here are methane clouds in the troposphere. Amazing. And I, I remember being at um, Cornell University uh, when um, I was working on this problem with Bob Samuelson. Uh, Carl Sagan was working on this problem. And a group from Canada, whose names I'm sorry I forget, were working on this problem of methane clouds in the atmosphere of Titan. We're all using the same data from Voyager 1 uh, uh, observations. And a uh, Canadian group said, there are clearly no methane clouds. Uh, Sagan and Thompson said, yes, there are. And Bob and I said, I don't think we know yet. <laughs> and, uh, turns out there are. Uh, so um, the probe landed on the surface. We knew that the surface was um, probably had um, a collection of liquids on it. And we knew that from atmospheric modeling from the Voyager uh, data, also um, from uh, active radar measurements from Arecibo. Uh, where we bounced radar uh, signals off the surface to see what the scattering profile looked like. And so Huygens was designed to not only land on a hard surface, but a mushy surface or in a lake. And uh, it turns out that it landed in something kind of marshy. Um, mm -hmm. What you see here are uh, rocks, uh, probably water ice, uh, covered with um, tholins, these uh, atmospheric uh, 
prebiotic chemicals, hydrocarbons, and nitriles, and so on that are falling down through the atmosphere. And then you see some smoother areas, which uh, uh, appear to be um, liquid hydrocarbons on the surface at the landing spot of Huygens. And some of those pebbles, if you like, are quite rounded, aren't they? As if they, they've definitely been in some sort of liquid. Uh, there is erosion on the yep. surface, not only from li liquid and atmospherics and so on. And um, so, uh, yeah, there's, uh, they, they do not appear jagged at all. From the um, Cassini orbiter, they were able to um, take radar measurements of the surface. This is a false color image just to show detail. Well, I guess if you're doing radar measurements, you don't have any color, at least mm -hmm. in visible part of the spectrum. But this just shows the uh, a collection um, uh, near the poles of um, uh, of lakes on the surface of Titan. Are, are the lakes restricted to the, the polar areas? Uh, they're not restricted to the polar areas. Um, we, can, we see them um, at all latitudes. So. Right. This is an interesting experiment that was done. This is called a radio occultation experiment. Um, you can um, uh, fly the spacecraft behind Titan uh, send a radio signal through the edge of the atmosphere and kind of pan down through the atmosphere. And then the Earth receives that signal, <clears throat> which is deflected at some angle or, and its intensity reduced at some proportion. And that, that observation gives you a quantity called temperature over mean molecular weight in the atmosphere and allows you to make temperature profiles. So the mean molecular weight is very, very close to 28 two times 14 uh, nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen. Um, and so we're able to get um, a temperature profile, at least for that location, showing how the temperature varies with height. And you can see here in this little graph that Titan has a troposphere like, just like the Earth does. It has a tropopause where the temperature turns over and starts increasing with height. And it has a stratosphere. Fantastic. Uh, I showed you a, uh, the Voyager's uh, infrared spectrum of the atmosphere. This is the Cassini infrared spectrum. This was taken by an instrument called SEERS, the Composite Infrared Spectrometer, aboard the Cassini orbiter. And um, so here we have much higher resolution data uh, identifying all kinds of chemicals, um, and uh, some of them building blocks for life, like hydrogen cyanide. Um, and so we see this atmosphere that is mildly reducing and um, and it also uh, produces uh, somewhat of a greenhouse effect on Titan. As cold as the surface of Titan is, about 95 Kelvin, <clears throat> there's about, a, and I'm sorry, I forgot to convert this, there's about a 38 degree increase in the surface temperature Fahrenheit from um, what it would be without uh, an atmosphere. And this is caused by these, um, these um, chemical species that are uh, asymmetrical, absorbing um, absorbing energy and uh, re-emitting it back down to the surface, just like we have on Earth. And of course, of course, methane is a, a, an extremely potent uh, greenhouse gas. Yes, absolutely, and the and the primary volatile uh, species in the uh, in the lower atmosphere of Titan. Sure, sure. From all of this, we're able to construct some models of what the uh, internals of uh, Titan might look like. And what I want to point your attention to here is that um, there is some indication that there may be a global subsurface ocean uh, with liquid water, perhaps um, mixed with um, methane or other hydrocarbons. This is not uh, a surprise because when you fly a spacecraft by Titan, and you measure the, the degree that its trajectory is um, modified by the gravity of Titan, it's not that much. And it equates to a bulk uh, density of about two grams per cubic centimeter. Right. Um, Earth is about five and a half grams, so the Earth is much more rocky. So we know there's a lot of water either in liquid form or water ice uh, making up the composition of Titan. This is um, another image from Cassini showing a region where it appears that there's some cryovolcanism cryo on the surface of Titan. This is suspected uh, for a while, but here we have some observational evidence. Really exciting finding. 
Um, three images uh, from, again, from the VIMS instrument uh, on Cassini showing um, all sides, all surface areas of Titan. Again, you see the darker areas as the lakes. You see uh, the very white, whitish areas as clouds. Uh, you see uh, surface areas as well as some, um, um, I guess these are, uh, I think these are cloud regions, I'm not sure, uh, in the polar areas. Mm. Yeah, probably. I just think this is a lovely oh, image. Beautiful. Look at that haze. <laughs> It's a bit, it's a bit colorized, but uh, you see the red orange uh, atmosphere of Titan and the detached haze layer that we, as I mentioned, that we see on Pluto as mm. well as Titan. And it turns out that I painted something that looks an awful lot like this about 30 years ago. Really? So I wonder if it was, uh, you know, prolific. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite images. Believe it or not, uh, Cassini got this image just at the right time, just at the right angle to have sunlight reflecting off one of the hydrocarbon lakes on Titan and wow. into the image of Cassini. Just remarkable. Is, is that reflection actually an image of the sun? <laughs> it, it is sunlight. It is sunlight reflecting off, off the lake. Yeah, but that, that bright spot is, is, are we looking at a, a, a direct reflection of the sun? That's amazing. Oh, well, I don't know if that's, I, I wouldn't say that is an image, a, a, a spatially resolved image of the sun. Mm. I, think that, I think that's a gradation in. Yes, in probably, yeah. But yeah. it's very bright, isn't it? Amazing. Titan is an incredible world. It is. So this is an interesting place. It has uh, water, liquid water, probably. Models indicate below the surface. It has a prebiotic atmosphere. It has lakes and rivers and seasons and winds and uh, you know what do you want out of a out of a body in the solar system? And so <laughs> we're spending uh, some more tax dollars, at least of the Americans American tax dollars, to go take an even closer look. And this is the Dragonfly mission that will launch, I believe, in 1996. I'm sorry, 2026. <laughs> 2026, I'm yeah. dating myself a little here. This is actually an octocopter. It will have eight propellers, uh, eight propeller systems that will fly it around through the atmosphere of, of Titan. Now, of course, we have a, a drone on the surface of Mars that's flying. Uh, Mars atmosphere being one about 1% 1 the density of Earth's, so that's a tough ordeal. Mm. But um, the atmosphere of Titan, 50% uh, greater surface pressure, no problem. And this, and this drone, therefore, can be somewhat larger. And it's about the size of a, maybe a small school bus. It's, it's, rather, it's rather large with a uh, RTG on the, um, on the back end here, a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator nuclear power source and it is going to parachute into the atmosphere of titan I'll show you here in a minute oh, uh, all over some of the uh, parts it, it will have um uh various instruments uh, of course it will have visual imagers and spectrometers and um instruments to measure the um the winds and pressures and temperatures and so on uh at the surface of titan just one thing occurred to me about that. Mm -hmm. Are they at all worried that if it lands on the surface, it might actually freeze and get stuck to the surface? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, in order to do that, you'd have to be able to liquefy water a little bit, right? Yeah, true. Water. true. That's not going to happen on the surface of Titan. Yeah. Um, no, the, this, is, uh, this uh, probe is being developed by the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. And believe me, they are taking the cold temperatures and what we know of the composition of the surface uh, into account. I'm sure they are. The hope is that not only will they get more information about this, the solid surface and the atmosphere, but also the liquid surface. Um, I believe there's a mass spectrometer on board that's going to be able to tell us more about the composition of all three of those. Uh, any idea how long they're expecting Dragonfly to last? 
Um, well, I uh, let's see. I I, be, I believe I have to check. I believe the um, the planned mission on on the surface is two years. Two years. Uh, wow. Earth years. Earth years. Um, Earth years. Yeah. But I imagine um, almost everything that we send up now is uh, 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 far more uh, durable than um, than its planned lifetime. Sure. And so it, it's not unusual. In fact, I think it's almost the rule that we um, send up missions that uh, are uh, that exceed their lifetime and we ask for extended uh, funding. Mm -hmm. And we get that. And if you just look at the Voyager missions, you can uh, understand um, uh, what that's about. Let's see. It must be so incredibly hard to design a vehicle that's going to work in those low temperatures and work reliably. I, I suspect. I was um, in Barrow, Alaska, a number of years ago, and I remember it was hard just to get my uh, just to get my uh, my cell phone operating and. Really, in 40 degree below temperatures. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, two years is is um, is not a correct number. I think it's more like two months. Two months, right? Or for the initial, right? For the initial planned mission. Right. Sorry, but as you say, it'll you know, if if past experience is anything to go by, especially with the uh, the MERs, then it'll probably last a lot longer. Right. Uh, just a um, indication of uh, how it plans to get there. Many uh, gravity assists. Uh, that means you don't have to um, have as uh, large a booster, and you can do this more energy efficiently. It will begin aero braking through the atmosphere of Titan, and then it will open a parachute that will uh, slow it down to, until it's able to drop its uh, drop its heat shield, and it's actually going to just drop this thing in midair and its rotors will begin operating and it will fly itself to, the, to its uh, uh, surface. And remember, we're a billion and a half kilometers away, so we're not using a joystick to do this. So it has, yeah. some, it has sensors and it has intelligence that's going to be able to pick out a suitable landing site. Um, I think in I think in real stream this can cannot play. Okay, right. So this was a um, uh, a video of releasing the um, the Dragonfly uh, probe. Uh, oh yes, you'd, yes, you'd, you'd have to show your screen for that, unfortunately. Right, mm -hmm. and so it will um, it will copter itself down to the surface. Uh, raise its communication antenna. It will, be, it will be able to receive signals from the Earth uh, over long periods of time. It will send up um, uh, science packages to tell it what we'd like it to do. And then it will fly off and look for a suitable landing site. And it will actually um, be able to fly a little bit further. It does this kind of hip hop motion where it flies beyond that site, looks for other landing sites, comes back to the original site, and then does that same kind of um, progression again. Right. And I think that is it. Totally autonomously. <laughs> totally autonomously, that's right. Amazing, amazing. Yep, that's it. Right. Well, thank you so much, Lou, and I hope, viewers, you've enjoyed that look at uh, at that uh, fascinating yeah, world title. Fascinating. And, uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Lou. That was absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> so there you are. That's Titan. And as I said, this is the first series, uh, first in a series of Moons of the Week. And uh, what would you, our viewers, like to see um, in this series? If you've got a particularly uh, a moon that you're particularly fond of and you'd like to learn more information about, then pop it in the chat now, um, and um, and uh, we'll 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 see what we can do. So as for next week's moon, we need to discuss what we're going to tackle next week. But uh, I can guarantee you it'll be interesting. Because uh, button moon, button moon, button moon. Yes, okay, yeah. right. <laughs> don't give up your day job. And uh, Steve's got a question in the chat now. It, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody can help him with that. What happened? What happens at the end of mission? Uh, will the power generating device remain on Titan for good? Is there a danger of polluting? Well, uh, the mission will remain on Titan. It's not coming back. And so it's, it's RTG will remain with it and it should be, um, it is well contained. 
Um, I think the, the, the prospects for pollution are very slim. You might remember that the Cassini spacecraft um, uh, also flew to Saturn with an RTG and it did a number of gravity assists before it got there and one of the gravity assists was with Earth. And so there were some environmentalists who were very concerned about what happens if it kind of misses its uh, trajectory and, and hits Earth's atmosphere and uh, this radioactive material gets in the atmosphere and kills us all. Um, and the truth is that this, um, this stuff is packed um, uh, very tightly. And uh, uh, my understanding is you can put a string of dynamite around these, uh, the, these RTGs. Um, hmm. It's plutonium and uh, and blow it and and you won't uh, see any degradation. So it's um, uh, uh, the opportunity for p pollution on Titan. I think is very very low. I mean, they they drop these RTGs out of planes at fifty thousand feet, and you know they they survive. So you know they are designed not to break open. They're baked into ceramics, actually. Mm. So that's 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 part yeah, of yeah. That's right. 